Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know is your forgiveness. Good evening. Tonight, we join with millions of Christians around the world remembering the work of God on the cross of Calvary. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ 
God's only son gave his life to pay the penalty for sin. Through the ages, his death stands as a testimony of God's power and God's grace. Tonight, we remember the cross and we remember our Savior. Remembering him leaves us both sad and joyful. We remember his pain, his suffering, his sacrifice with sadness. We also realize that our freedom, our forgiveness, and our hope is because of that same cross. And that's the joy. We remember that it's the grace of God that made it all possible. We remember the cross with a sense of wonder and holy awe. We join with all God's church in worshiping God because he came to earth and he lived among us. He experienced death so you and I might experience life. So welcome. I'm delighted that you're here. Uh, we continue the celebration tomorrow and Sunday. Extravaganza bridge event designed for families is from 10 o'clock tomorrow morning to 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Thanks for all of you who are serving and uh, working and set up and tear down. I'm grateful to you. Then our Easter services tomorrow night at 5 o'clock, Sunday morning at 8.30, 10, and 11.30. Remember, there's no uh, connection classes or PM service. The Easter service will be, will be fun. There will be funny moments. It will be fast moving. Most importantly, we'll present people with the opportunity to put their faith and their trust in Jesus. So it's not too late to invite someone to come with you. Tonight, as we remember Jesus' sacrifice, we give back to him. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave. Our ushers are coming. Giving is an expression of love and thanksgiving to God. He expressed love to us by giving. And giving is one way we express love back to him. Now, if you're visiting with us tonight, please, I don't want you to feel any obligation or any pressure to give. We're honored to have you here with us. For, for many of our church family, this is their opportunity this weekend to give back to the Lord. And so we're going to do that together. Lord, we're grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you that you evidenced your love to us. And on, on this night, we remember a night 2,000 years ago that changed the world. And we thank you for it. We thank you for giving your life. And we give to you in thanksgiving for all that you've done in our lives. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
I'm so thankful for grace, aren't you? Everything God has done for us is because of grace. Grace is the undeserved, loving work of God to restore our relationship to him by making sin powerless. We love to talk about grace. We love to sing about grace. Maybe the most well-loved and well-known song, hymn of the church, is Amazing Grace. You know it. It goes like this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves. gift to restore relationship with him. You can't earn grace. You don't deserve grace. You can't buy grace or manipulate God into giving it to you. Grace is free and an undeserved gift from God. And God's grace is the constant thread throughout the whole Bible. The Bible is a story of how God overcame our separation from him and brought us back into relationship with him through grace. Now, on our own, we've made a mess of our lives. But Jesus came into our world and died for us, forever freeing us from the penalty of sin. His grace is a gift. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2 says it, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a what? The gift of God. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul continues, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a what? A gift. God saw all your faults and failures. And rather than destroying you or casting you out, He chose to offer you a gift of grace. Think of grace as a gift that's just sitting on a table. The gift's there for you, and it's available, but you choose whether or not you take and receive that gift. You choose to receive grace when you place your hope and trust in Jesus Christ, when you ask him for forgiveness of your sins, when you make him the Lord of your life, grace is received, and his grace transforms your whole life. Now, the cross, it was the, God's greatest gift to humanity. John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. 
And then Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. God gave his son, Jesus, and Jesus gave his life for us. His gift wasn't his life. No, his gift was his death. Several years ago, I was uh, cleaning out a drawer in my office, and I found a folder that was labeled cards, and in it were thank you cards, cards from my family, cards from some of you, just all kinds of cards, and there was an envelope in in that folder with nothing written on the outside. I opened it up and I found several gift cards. Well, that makes sense. You know, gift cards should be in the card folder. I had no idea how long the envelope was there in that folder. I don't remember putting it there and I was excited. I had money I had no idea about just sitting there next to me. So I thought, what's well do? I'll call and looked over on the back and got the phone number and I called the first one. There were five gift cards. The first one I called had a zero balance. Number two, called it, zero balance. Of the five cards, four had expired already, and the fifth one had a couple dollars left on it. I don't know how long they sat there in that, wasting. And the person who had paid the price for that gift, they'd wasted their money. I wasted their gift by not using them. Don't waste the gift of the cross. An unopened gift brings no joy to the giver nor the recipient. Grace unused is a tragedy. The word grace sort of changed its meaning through the years, hasn't it? In some families, before you eat a meal, you say grace. And that's usually what they mean by that is you say a prayer and say you're thankful for what you're about to eat. My family growing up, the goal was to get through the prayer as fast as possible. God is great. God is good. Let us thank for the food. Amen. Pass the potatoes. <laughs> Some of you had the same family apparently. <laughs> you see, we, we'd memorize the words so that we could say them without thinking. Saying grace was just rote, it was just perfunctory, something you just did. I'm afraid we've turned grace, amazing grace, into something ordinary and trivial. Your credit card bill, well, it has a due date on it, May 1st, let's say. But you have a grace period of 10 days before you get in trouble for not paying. Grace periods are when you get away with not doing what you're supposed to already be doing. And we've come to expect grace periods for every bill we pay. We expect to get grace when we do wrong. We've turned the gift of grace into the expectation of grace. How sad that we've turned miraculous, wonderful, amazing, beautiful grace of the Lord Jesus Christ into an expectation for how we should live. How sad we've trivialized it. How sad we've wasted the gift of grace. Grace is powerful. Grace is more powerful than all our sins. Grace is special. Grace is amazing. Grace, God's grace, poured out on us is beautiful, amazing, powerful, and wonderful. God's grace should be treasured and should be revered. Your tender mercies like a river with no end. It overwhelms me, covers my sin. Each time I come into your presence, I stand in wonder once again your grace still amazes me your love is still a mystery each day
Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 2, when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. And then at the end of verse 14, he says this, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. Grace in the New Testament is always related to the death of Jesus on the cross. The cross changed everything. Rome used the cross to oppress people it wanted to enslave. Jesus used the cross to liberate people he wanted to set free. An instrument of execution became a gift of freedom. A symbol of defeat became our symbol of victory. The cross changed from a cruel threat into an expression of ultimate hope. It came, in a sense, to express the exact opposite of its original purpose, that the power of embraced sacrifice is greater than the power of coerced submission. It used to represent death, but my friends, the cross represents life. Rome killed thousands, but only one cross still stands and impacts the world today. 2,000 years later, Jesus' death is the most significant, most important, most remembered death in the history of the world. The cross itself stands at the center of of Christianity. It's at the center of the New Testament. You can't have Christianity without the cross. Jesus without the cross is just another prophet, just another miracle worker, just another man with a message. But the cross was powerful then and is powerful today. Yes. 
The crucifixion of Jesus was a one-off event. The one moment in history on behalf of all others. The cross robbed sin and evil of its power and sent Satan running in defeat. The powerful cross, our powerful cross, in its grace can never be taken from us. It can never be stolen. It can never run away. I love the song, In Christ Alone. We sing it. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck us from his hand, I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. Now, do you, do you ever pray that God will forgive you for something, and you pray over and over again? Maybe you did something a year ago, or five years ago, maybe it was even 20 years ago. And you wonder if God really forgave you. And you, you struggle. You've sincerely asked him and you've cried out to him. And you mean it when you pray. But you just aren't sure yet. The shame is so strong. Listen carefully what to, I'm about to say. God heard you. And God forgave you. Why? Because God loves you. You are forgiven. By his powerful and wonderful grace. He doesn't see you through your past failures. He sees you from the cross. Now Jesus' last words on the cross were, it is finished. Now why would he say that? Was he saying he was finished? Was, was he saying his life was over? Was he saying that, man, this wasn't worth all the effort? No, those words were not some last gasp of a revolutionary whose revolution was over. They were not a signal of feat, a defeat. They were not an admission that Jesus had failed. No, it is finished was a declaration that Jesus had won. That no matter what hell throws at us, the work of Jesus is finished. Every time the devil comes to you and says, God won't forgive you for what you've done, you remember the cross. It is finished. Every time you feel guilt and shame for something you've done in your past and you, your mind won't let go of it, you remember it is finished finished. Every time someone from your past shows up and tries to drag you back to an old way of living that you've said no to in the past, you look at them and say, it is finished. Every time, every time you have thoughts of self-doubt and self-worth and you question whether you have value or if anyone, if you matter at all to anyone, you remember Jesus and the cross and say, it is finished. Every time you feel tempted to quit, to throw in the towel or give up, you remember, it is finished. In every situation, remember the cross, it is finished. Finished. No more wondering if you can make it. No more questioning whether or not God will forgive you. No more carrying around sin from the past. My friends, it is finished. You're not finished. It is finished.
flesh is waging war within Though sin remains, our guilt is gone It was finished on the cross It was finished on the Remember the cross with worship and with prayer. Tonight we also remember the cross by taking communion. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, told his disciples that his life and his death had to happen. He instructed them and us not to forget. His exact words were, do this in remembrance of me. We take communion to remember what he did. In dying for us. The ushers are coming to serve you with the elements of communion. As the tray goes by, take a piece of bread, take a cup of juice, and just hold it for a few moments. And then in, in a moment, we will all receive communion together. We don't have rules about communion here. You don't have to be a member of our church to celebrate Jesus' death and resurrection. Instead of we invite all of God's family to join with us as we remember his sacrifice.
I've invited my friend Diana to, to read with us several verses of Scripture. First, where Jesus talks about his body from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. Yo recibí del Señor lo mismo que les transmití a ustedes, que el Señor Jesús, la noche en que fue traicionado, tomó pan, y después de dar gracias, lo partió y dijo, este pan es mi cuerpo, que por ustedes entrego. Hagan esto en memoria de mí. His body was broken. He took pain and suffering, so that he could identify with your pain and suffering. Isaiah said, by his stripes, we are healed. Jesus purchased your healing on the cross. And tonight I want to pause this service and pray for you if you need, if you need to be healed, if you need a touch of healing. Would you, just, would you just stand up right where you're at? If you're watching online, uh, just, uh, just type in the, in the text field down there and And Nick is, is going to lead you in prayer as well. If somebody near you is standing, would you, would you just quietly stand with them and put your hand on their shoulder and, and we're going to pray and we're just going to believe together right now for healing. Jesus, we thank you that included on, on the sacrifice and the, the price you paid on the cross, is our healing. Lord, thank you that you took on pain and you took on suffering. Thank you for what you bore so that you could identify with us. Thank you for the price you paid that we could be healed. Lord, I pray for people in this room standing right now that the healing touch of Jesus would touch their body. Lord, let infection be gone. Let disease be gone. Lord, I pray that where there's been death, there would be life. Where there's been sickness, there would be health. Where there's been disease, there would be wholeness. What's been broken would be made whole by the power of Jesus. Lord, I pray for strength to return into bodies right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for people watching online that you would touch their body right now with healing because you are the healer. Lord, I pray for those whose, whose hurts may not be visible or physical, but rather they're emotional and deep. Pray for people that have been hurt and wounded by others. I pray for people who are, who are hiding a hurt that they've never shared. Lord, let your, let your healing flow right now to the deepest part of our souls and to the, the seat of our hurt with your healing. Lord, we thank you for including healing in the price you paid. We remember your body that was broken for us as we eat the bread together. In Jesus' name, and amen. Paul continued and wrote about uh, Jesus' blood and his instructions to us. De la misma manera, después de cenar, tomó la copa y dijo, Esta copa es el nuevo pacto en mi sangre. Hagan esto. Cada vez que beban en, de ella en memoria de mí. Porque cada vez que coman este pan y beben de esta copa, proclaman la muerte del Señor hasta que Él venga. Because Jesus' blood was shed on the cross. And I use that word very intentionally, shed. Jesus' blood wasn't spilled, like some songs say. Because a spill is an accident. Jesus' decision to shed His blood was a purposeful, intentional decision. And he paid the price with his blood so that you could be forgiven. Would you bow your heads with me? And I want to pray for you. And together, pray for his forgiveness. Maybe you've never, maybe you've never prayed and asked Jesus to forgive you. Tonight, on Good Friday night, as we, as we look back to the cross, can be a day where you look forward to new life with him. Maybe it's sometime you've prayed a prayer, but you've been far away. I want to pray for you. And I think it's important for all of us to remember that we are not without sin. We sin and fail daily, and his grace and forgiveness still extends because of his blood. So Jesus, we claim 
the price you paid on the cross is sufficient for our sin. Lord, I pray for people who their life is is a disaster. They never plan on being here now. And they look around and say, "What, what can ever make this right again? What can ever fix this? I pray right now, just in the quietness of this room, they'd breathe a simple prayer to you. Jesus, forgive me because of your blood. Lord, we all stand as sinners. Thank you that your your forgiveness extends to us each and every day. Thank you that forgiveness is not a one-time event that's hit or miss, but instead, your grace is available every day. And so we call on your grace and your forgiveness today. Lord, we pray for people we love and people in our lives who are yet, have yet to experience that forgiveness. We pray, God, that they would experience the same joy and acceptance and inclusion in your family that we've experienced. We thank you, Jesus, for your blood that was shed on the cross. We celebrate your sacrifice and what it purchased for us. We thank you for the mighty cross as we drink this juice together. Come on, would you just thank him in your own way? We thank you, Jesus. We're so grateful to you, Lord. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross.
cross with wonder, awe, and thanksgiving. Jesus gave his life on the cross for you and for me. We celebrate the grace made available because of the cross. And perhaps the best known Bible verse about grace is the one we read earlier from Ephesians chapter 2. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. You didn't earn salvation. You can't earn salvation. We are saved by the grace, the free gift of God. And thank God for his remarkable, amazing grace. I want to back up a few verses in that chapter. Ephesians 2 starts by talking about how we are caught and lost in sin, disobedience, and death. And then, in verse 4, Paul moved from sin to the grace of God. But God, so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Now, some of you have been taught that the stuff in the parentheses doesn't matter as much, but that's not true this time. Look what it says. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Now I want to slow down and look at this next verse. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. The cross is an example of grace. But there is another example of grace. A powerful example of grace. You. God points to you as an example of the incredible wealth of his grace. Do you get that? That's awesome. You are an example of grace. And you might be thinking, me? After, after everything I've done, after all the sins I'm committed, well, Romans 5.20 says this, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Sin loses to grace. Grace wins every time. More sin, more grace. The greater the sin, the greater the grace that God gives. And the greater the grace given, the greater glory God receives. The greater the sin, the greater the victory. The greater the victory, the greater the trophy. You are a trophy of God's grace. (laughs) 
Now this is a trophy I received when my third grade basketball team won the Slam Basketball League. I still have it. Even though it has been more than 15 years, even though Meredith would probably like me to throw it away, I still keep the trophy. Do you know why I still have this? Certainly not because it's valuable. It's metal and plastic. This trophy is worthless to anyone but me, but this trophy is a reminder. Every time I take it down and look at it, I remember the season. I remember the game. I remember the story. See, I got the trophy for winning, but I keep the trophy because it reminds me of the victory. Trophies bring smiles to the face and victories to the mind. Some of you have trophy cabinets. You've kept every trophy that you have ever won. If you go to North Little Rock High School, there is a huge trophy case filled with trophies. They are there so when students walk down the hall, when they walk past the case, they remember we are the champions. We won that victory. Trophies are a reminder of past victories. A few weeks ago, the Super Bowl was played and won by the Philadelphia Eagles. I stayed tuned in to watch the post-game show. They were trying to get the trophy to the stage for the presentation, but they had a problem. All of the Eagles players pressed in towards the trophy. They wanted to touch and kiss that trophy, and that makes no sense. It's just a piece of metal. But it's not the trophy that mattered. It's what it represented. A battle hard fought and a victory won. You are a trophy of God's grace. Paul said, God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness. God looks at you and he sees a battle where sin lost and grace won. You are God's evidence of a victory. Now I know this isn't biblical and I don't know if it really happens, but here is how I picture this verse lived out. God is leading a tour through heaven and he stops at a window to look into the sanctuary at First NLR. I know, I know, that might not be true, but it might be, you don't know. <laughs> God looks down and sees a service like this and he just starts to smile. And it's not because of the big crowd. His smile isn't because of the great music. Instead, I think God pauses the tour with a smile on his face and starts pointing out some trophies. Yep. You see that usher? That's Leon Brockington. Leon was a, a hopeless alcoholic. His wife prayed for years, but Leon was a stubborn drunk. Then one rainy Sunday night, Leon walked down the aisle, knelt at the front, and he confessed his sins to me, and he committed his life to me. And that night, I not only saved Leon, I delivered him from alcohol. You see Leon, I see a trophy, a reminder of a victory one. God points over there and says, that's Louise. Her story is heartbreaking. She was trafficked and, and forced into a life of prostitution. She was miserable, afraid, and alone. But then Louise was saved, delivered, and set free. You see an ordinary woman with a big smile on her face. I see Louise, a victory won, a trophy of my grace. You see Rachel? Uh, Rachel never walked away from me. She was raised in church and followed me her whole life. What a beautiful story. She received my grace at an early age and has never turned back. You see, Rachel, I see a trophy of grace. And don't even get me started on that choir. Wow, I got a lot of stories on that stage. And if you turn back the clock, there's a bunch of them that you would never expect to be on the stage singing about the cross and the grace. That whole bunch, they are trophies of my grace. This entire room is God's trophy case. I picture God pointing and saying over there, 
She was abandoned by her parents. Everyone pointed to her failure, but look at her now. When she encountered me, everything changed. She is a trophy. You see that guy? He was mean and miserable and made everyone around him miserable. It appeared that sin had won, but then one day in jail, he heard the truth and prayed the first prayer of his entire life. He's not mean or miserable. He's a trophy. You see that student? Yeah, she messed up horribly. Everyone knew about her, but then grace. She's not a victim. She's a trophy, a trophy of my grace. You see him? He was a horrible racist. He hated people who didn't look like him. But then one day, I sent an old lady with a heart full of love. She hugged him and the hate melted away. Now he's filled with love. He is a trophy of grace. You see the guy in the back? He was an addict. He came with Union Rescue Mission. They brought him to church where he met Jesus. And he's no longer an addict. He's another trophy of my... You heard that pastor talking earlier? He had a hard life. He was walked away from me and he didn't know where he was going. But then one day he made the decision to follow me. And my grace took over. He's a trophy of my grace. You see that worship leader? He was lost. He felt like a failure, but one day my grace took over his life. I took over his life and he's a trophy of my grace. You see that lead pastor of the church? He was an introvert. He was afraid to talk in front of a crowd. And now he stands in front of thousands of people proclaiming my name. He is a trophy of my grace. right now nobody thought he'd ever be up there preaching about my name and sharing my story but one day he decided to follow me and I changed his life he is a trophy of my grace I think God points up and down the aisles you see her she's a trophy I remember that moment I remember his prayer That one, well, sin was tugging hard, but grace won. My grace is enough. If you are looking for grace, look around. This room is filled with trophies of God's grace. You are a trophy of God's grace. may have come tonight feeling like a failure, feeling like you couldn't make it, feeling like you were a mistake, but listen to me, you are a trophy of God's grace. God's grace is enough. God's grace is greater than anything you could ever face, you could ever do, any situation you've ever been in. God's grace is enough. You are a trophy of God's grace. We are the evidence of God's grace. And that means you are the proof of His grace. You are a living, breathing example of the powerful work on the cross that day 2,000 years ago. You aren't worthless, useless, or hopeless. You are a gleaming, shining, prized, loved, forgiven, valued, treasured trophy of God's grace. alone my hope is found oh he is my life my strength my song he's called a stone this solid ground 
firm through the fiercest cloud and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comfort.
<laughs> One more time, sing it with me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, that you don't see us as a reject or a misfit or a loser or a has-been, but we're forgiven and we're trophies of your grace. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Easter weekend.